Thank you, uh, Margaret. It's great to be back here. Great to be with you um, again. Happy to get another bite of this apple, um, as I'm sure your Carolina Panthers are uh, this evening as well. Um, <clears throat> I was charged uh, with catching folks up with, uh, on trends and access and student success, both nationally and in North Carolina. Um, I have, I've prepared a bunch of material. If I don't get through it all, it'll be publicly available. Uh, you can always click through it, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I really want to do get uh, uh, Matt. Matt traveled all this way from Washington, D.C., um, uh, so I want to make sure we get to him uh, with adequate time. Um, so just a quick reminder, uh, uh, the last um, uh, board meeting was focused on the areas, uh, our strategic themes of economic impact and excellent diverse institutions. This meeting uh, designed to focus on access and student success. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, uh, a quick outline. Uh, I thought I'd try to motivate our discussion with just a broad question. Why should we worry about student access and success in this state? Um, uh, then we'll talk about trends in higher education access, trends in student success, and some policy implications, which I think will lead into Matt's discussion of performance-based funding uh, pretty well. Uh, so I wanted to lay a puzzle on the table. Right? So North Carolina has one of the fastest growing economies, uh, one of the fastest growing populations in the country. We have a top state university system with comparatively low tuition and above average completion rates. And yet, North Carolina per capita income is, uh, it ranks 39th in the country. Um, it has fallen since 2005 as a percentage of the United States per capita income. We also have among the worst rates of economic mobility in the country uh, for native born North Carolinians. Uh, the Belk Endowment just did a study uh, earlier this summer, um, and it found that uh, 20, using the Equality of Opportunity Project data, found that 22 of 24 commuting zones in North Carolina fall in the bottom quarter nationally when it comes to economic mobility, students chan children's chances to rise uh, higher than their parents. Let me be clear about this. The UNC system did not cause this puzzle, OK? But it has a massive opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to help solve it. Um, and it starts with student access and success, with improving rates of student access and success. That's because um, higher education can be a mighty engine, in the words of President Friday. This is a slide that you may remember from my, my first talk. This shows the chances of move, uh, uh, the chances, uh, sorry, the, the quintile, uh, your adult, the quintile you fall into as an adult if you are born in the bottom and it's disaggregated by your education. So in the gray is you, you earned a college degree, uh, a four-year college degree, and orange is it, it, or maroon, depending on your computer, uh, if you did not earn a degree. You can see here, if you, if you earn a degree, you have a 10% chance. If you're born in the bottom and you earn a degree, you have a 10% chance of winding up in the bottom as an adult. It's nearly five times as high if you don't earn a degree. And the effect is actually uh, even more impressive, in my opinion, for the second quintile. If you're born in the second quintile, you have a 40% chance of reaching the top quintile if you earn a, a four-year college degree. Um, so it's a mighty, it can be, can be a mighty engine, but it leaves many behind. So this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, this comes from the Education Longitudinal Study. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it followed uh, high school sophomores in 2002 for 10 years. And the number I want to draw your attention to, this chart disaggregates uh, by SES and by math achievement. So math achievements along the x-axis and the colors are low SES, middle SES, and high SES. Socioeconomic status is an aggregation of income and, and, and occupation. Um, so the number I want to draw your attention to is here. So if you're a low-income student, if you were a low-income student in 2002, high school sophomore, and you scored in, in the highest quartile on the math achievement assessment, your probability of earning a bachelor's degree in 10 years was the same as an affluent student who scored in the, in the second, second quartile. Right? This, so we're controlling here, we're sort of controlling here for ability, right? A lot of the, a lot of the gaps we see are, based, are, are because of preparation and, and inadequate um, K-12 education. This sort of controls for that, and it shows you this is sort of, th these are the people that are being left behind. Um, these, these, these numbers obviously are, are following 2002 high school sophomores. I doubt it looks any different now, and, if, and, and it may even look worse, frankly, um, given the trends in, in, in uh, intuition uh, and other things. So <coughs> the story on access and completion. We've made lots of gains, we've made, we've made uh, large gains in access, but stubborn gaps still remain, as you saw in the last slide. Graduation rates have actually declined slightly. Uh, not the institutional graduation rate that we look that we know from the federal data, but if you actually look at stu uh, if you follow students over time, National Student Clearinghouse finds that the, the rates have actually declined somewhat uh, in recent years, um, and, and and that's true of uh, four-year publics as well. Um, uh, and demographic gaps are pronounced in college completion. The UNC system, we know college completion rates are above average, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, 
So let me walk through some, some, some ideas on access. And part of what I'm trying to do here is provide the committees that are going to work on these issues on a strategic plan with some, with some, some things to think about as far as measuring access. Um, so should we measure access? Well, the, most simp the simplest measure of access is enrollment growth. Have our enrollments grown? Are we, are we providing access to more students? Does the UNC system reflect the state as a whole? Slightly different question. Um, are there participation gaps between groups of otherwise qualified students uh, between different demographic groups? So nationally, we've, we've seen enrollment growth. Uh, it, it really peaked during the recession because uh, the, the, the down economy led people back into the, back into the higher ed system. It's kind of tailed off a little bit, but, but that equates to a 16% increase over this time period. North Carolina basically mirrors it. Uh, uh, growth in enrollments kind of tapered off just a bit. Again, a 15% in increase. The question is, though, is the system keeping pace with changes in the K-12 system? So this just plots the change over time in graduates uh, from uh, K-12 schools here in North Carolina and, and UNC undergrad enrollments. And as you can see, the K-12 system is growing much faster than, uh, than, the, UNC, than the UNC system. Um, and the growth is particularly marked among traditionally underserved groups, right? So the Hispanic population between 2006 and 2015 in the public school, K-12 public school is 239%. I couldn't believe that. Uh, this is from federal data uh, between 2000 and 2014, different time frames, so not, not exactly comparable, but the number of receiving free or reduced price lunch in North Carolina, which is traditionally an indicator of economic hardship, of uh, disadvantage, grew by 330,000. That has a lot to do with the economy. It's not just in-migration of folks who, who are of families who are poor. Um, it also has to do with the fact that many more people were, were, were receiving those benefits uh, during the down economy. Nationally, we know we've seen we have persistent gaps in college entry by income. This is from a study by Martha Bailey and Susan Donarski at the University of Michigan. Uh, National Bureau of Economic Research released it in 2011. This compares two different birth cohorts. So uh, children who were born in the 1960s, in the early 1960s, to children who were born in the 1980s. Um, and you can see, so this is the lowest income quartile. You can see the, lowest, the group in the lowest income quartile did make a gain, 10 percentage point gain in, in enrollment in college. Um, but, the gain, but they're not keeping pace with their, with their upper income peers because th that gain was even larger, right? So we know the persistent gaps uh, in college entry by income. So let's shift now, knowing that, knowing that we have these gaps by income, does the does UNC system reflect the state as a whole? Uh, demographically, it looks pretty good, um, with the exception of Latinos and Latinas. Um, it's about a five percentage point gap. But I'd like to, to draw your attention again here to the low income. Uh, families earning under fifty thousand dollars a year, ten percentage point gap. Um, rural county, rural counties, uh, or folks from rural areas, eight percentage point gap. Tier two county that uh, on the tier tiered system of economic disadvantage, economic hardship, uh, another eight percent gap. And then men, six percentage point gap between men and women in terms of um, this compares. Uh, I should have said this up front, but this compares the undergrad, undergrad in-state headcount to the North Carolina population based on the American Community Survey. So, what, well, what do we know? Again, a lot of the gap in low income, uh, among low income students is likely to do with preparation and, and, and meeting minimum admission requirements, right? That's explaining some of this. But our friends from Gear Up shared some data um, uh, in some counties that they work in. So, uh, Lenore County, Scotland County, and Yancey County, very different counties demographically. Um, they shared some data uh, that showed that qualified students are just not enrolling anywhere. North Carolina. So of the, of the approximately 1,100 graduates from the Gear Up High Schools in those counties in 2014, this is the punchline. 477 didn't enroll anywhere, a lot of them because they were, they were not prepared for college. 133 of those students, 12% of graduating students, met the UNC minimum admission requirements. They didn't go anywhere. Some of them were making, probably making a, a, a fine decision. They got a good job and they were going to join the workforce. Um, maybe some had an apprenticeship or some other, uh, some other pathway. But these are the students that, that, that we're missing. Um, and and, and we, can, we can figure out ways to go out and find them and, and grab them. Obstacles to access. I've already talked about academic preparation. We know there are college readiness problems. Um, information about higher education options, financial aid, how to fill out a FAFSA. And I put, on, I put up here showing up because people who study what they call summer melt have found that students that take all the steps necessary to enroll in college just don't show up on the day classes start. Um, uh, you know, and, and in some urban districts, it's 40% of students fit into that category. This is work by Ben Castleman and Lindsay Page. Um, can't ignore, obviously, the cost of attendance. 
Some students just don't have the money after you account for Pell Grants and, loan, and federal loan limits. Um, and maybe their parents can't actually get a loan to cover the rest of the tuition. Um, and then, of course, adult students, right? We don't want to forget about adult students who either don't have a credential or, or are partway home, as, as, as folks like to say in this, uh, this state. Um, they have work and family commitments. Um, those, are, those are clear obstacles to access. They need flexible programs and flexible uh, 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 schedules. Uh, so the caveats, of course, access without attention to success can have unintended consequences, right? We've seen this where encouraging students who are not prepared to enroll in school who then take on debt and then drop out without a credential, they can have significant repayment problems. I talked about this in my last talk. There's also, the, there's also uh, uh, potential for reduced productivity in terms of public investments, right? So, so to the extent we're measuring our productivity in terms of, of uh, spending per credential completed or spending per positive outcome, if we're only focused on access and we're not focused enough on, on stu the student success side, we're actually gonna reduce the productivity of those public investments uh, the way we measure them. Um, and some obstacles are important to human capital production, right? This is one I think it's really important to remember and it gets at some of the potential perverse incentives here, right? If, if what we do is we sort of lower um, uh, academic standards and academic rigor, right, we're, not, we're gonna wind up in a, in a world where we're printing a lot of diplomas or actually inviting a lot of folks in but not necessarily adding to the stock of the state's human capital. So I'll move on to student success. Um, again, measuring student success, retention and completion rates, we're all familiar with those. Time to degree, uh, so not just did you complete a degree but how fast, how quickly did you complete it? Student learning, I know that's been a big topic around here. Um, Labor market success, North Carolina has some terrific data on that. Um, and then sort of other questions like quality of life, well-being, student satisfaction. How do graduates do on, on things other than just their job prospects? Do they feel like they're engaged at work in their communities? Do they have a high quality of life? Um, we, know, we know North Carolina is a, a UNC system is a leader on completion rates. Um, the federal data haven't caught up yet to, to UNC's data. Um, federal government moves slowly. Um, uh, this is the standard federal six-year graduation rate. Um, uh, most of you probably know this is a flawed rate. It doesn't count transfer students. It doesn't count students that uh, uh, enter in the spring. It only counts first-time, full-time students. So it leaves a lot of students out. Um, if, we, if we include students who finished at any UNC, not just the UNC campus they started at, uh, UNC, the UNC system looks, looks even better. So, you know, and the, the access doesn't even go all the way up to 100, right? But there's a lot of room here. Uh, not to say that graduation rates to, should be 100%, but there's room for improvement. Um, time of degree attainment. Okay, the good news, the four-year graduation rate across the UNC system is 10 percentage points higher than the uh, four-year graduation rate nationally for public colleges, right? The not-so-good news is that the four-year rates are low across the board, right? North Carolina still below 50% on four-year graduation rates for, full, for first time, full-time students. I'm uh, sorry, this is actually for any, and this is for any UNC campus. This is just the standard national rate. 10 percentage point gap, but they're low across the board. I mean, a, thir a third of students fin at four-year colleges finish in four years um, nationally, which is um, not good. Um, we know that there are gaps in college completion by family income. Um, the gap has actually grown over time. This is from that same paper that tracks the two cohorts, so 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s birth cohort in red and the 1960s birth cohort in blue. Again, uh, low-income students have, have made, the students born in the lowest income quartile have made gains, right? They've made a big gain, actually, 5% to 9%. Um, but the gain was swamped by, uh, by the gains made by the top quartile um, and, and, and their peers in other quartiles. So we're actually sort of, they're actually sort of losing ground in this college, college attainment <laughs> race. Uh, we know there are gaps by race and ethnicity. This is, a, this is from, um, again, from the Education Longitudinal Study uh, on, the, on the access, again, as um, um, socioeconomic status. Um, and then these are racial and ethnic categories. And so what you, what you see is that at, for the students in the lowest SES, with the exception of Asian students, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of completing a bachelor's degree at similar rates. Those gaps grow tremendously by race and ethnicity as you move up the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, you know, 40, 40 percent, uh, just over 40 percent of African American and Hispanic students uh, finished a degree, finished a degree from this cohort um, after 10 years, even even though they were high socioeconomic status. Um, nationally, we know there's also a gender gap. Um, we saw a gender gap in access. There's a gender gap in completion as well. Uh, this is from that same study. Again, the gap gets bigger actually as you go up the uh, as you go up the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, men. Men are underperforming women when it comes to college completion, and that's true here as well. 
What does it look like in North Carolina? Well, not surprisingly, the gaps mirror the national picture, right? Which is what you'd expect. Um, so we have, there's a 12 percentage point gap um, in, in, in graduation rate between Pell Grant recipients and students who didn't receive a Pell. That's, our, that's a proxy for low income status. Uh, there's a 17 percentage point gap between um, uh, non-minority and minority, under underrepresented minority students. Um, and there's an 8 percentage point gap between men and women. Um, so other outcomes of interest. Um, um, d degrees per FTE is one that has gotten some discussion around the country. You maybe have heard this before. This is a measure of productivity that doesn't, it's, it's not reliant on student cohorts uh, like the federal rate. So this just asks how many, how many um, uh, degrees are you producing, how many undergraduate credentials are you producing per 100 undergraduates that you enroll. Um, and for a four-year college, the closer to 25, the, the, it means the, the better you're doing as far as a four-year four productivity rate, if you will. Um, student learning, as I said before, uh, big discussion. Labor market outcomes, North Carolina has really good data on this. Their data are limited because you can't follow students across state lines and they don't cover federal employees uh, or military. Um, but uh, the, the latest data from North Carolina system find that 66% are employed or in graduate school in North Carolina five years after graduation. Sorry, I should, that should be up there. I didn't put that in there. And the mean annual wage five years after graduation, $37,000, just over $37,000. Um, Lastly, the measures of well-being, and I, this is where one, one thing I would recommend people take a look at the Gallup-Purdue Index. This is a project uh, uh, that, that Purdue University under, under Mitch Daniels' leadership and the Gallup uh, organization, the polling organization, they've partnered up and they've created a, uh, what, what they call the Gallup-Purdue Index. Um, and it actually asks lots of questions that are unrelated uh, or, or not necessarily directly related to financial returns. So it's things like, again, are you engaged, do you feel engaged in your community? Do you score high on... Uh, 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 a sense of purpose about your life. The things that, you know, often uh, universities say, we do more than just prepare people for jobs, rightfully so. Um, so uh, I do think this is something interesting to think about. Is it's, can we use an instrument like this to think about the other things that universities are doing other than just um, preparing students for the workforce? So state policies to improve access and success. And I promised you I was going to get to the segue, and I'm only one minute over time, so I'm doing pretty well. Um, my mouth's a little dry, though. Uh, so uh, state, state policies to improve uh, access and success. And these are all the policies that we're discussing now um, as part of the strategic plan. And so uh, you know, put them all on the table uh, for discussion. Improving college readiness. This is a difficult, uh, so, sort of a difficult task for a university system in some ways to do. But there are things that there are things the university system can do. Communicate clearly about the expectations for college readiness. What does it take to pass a college level course? Um, and, and are students in the high school pipeline qualified uh, to do that, and if not, what are the steps they can take in the interim to do so? Obviously, the teacher prep pipeline is a big piece of the college readiness equation, something we're going to be thinking about and talking about um, as part of our strategic plan and the implementation uh, therein. Um, Need-based financial aid is part of the conversation, obviously. North Carolina has a tradition of providing need-based financial aid through the state, um, um, and that has to be part of the, the conversation. Um, uh, there's you know, new, some new research on need-based financial aid that suggests that it does raise the probability of completion. Um, there's other studies that suggest that pairing some of that need-based aid with academic incentives and benchmarks can actually produce even greater outcomes. Uh, there's also a, a, a counseling piece, an advising piece. Can we couple some of this need-based aid with better, better advising? And that gets to, uh, also to the outreach and information to prospective students. These are the 133 students in those counties that, for some reason, didn't enroll anywhere, maybe some of them would like to come to UNC. Maybe some of them would like to come to your campus. Um, there's, this is a place where we actually have uh, very good rigorous evidence that even small, inexpensive informational nudges can move people into the educational pipeline um, and get them um, uh, uh, to a campus, get them to enroll in a campus that's an academic match for them where they're likely to be successful. Um, and they're cheap. You know, uh, the, the, the folks at the, uh, 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 Carolyn Hawksby uh, at, at Harvard and um, Sarah Turner at UVA sent students um, booklets through the College Board that just showed them, just hard copy, you know, no website, no fancy bells and whistles, hard copy. Here are the, here are the places you could go, here are the net prices you're likely to see. Um, Six dollars a, a packet, basically, was the overall cost, um, and they found big effects on application and enrollment behavior. So, and then the last one is performance-based funding which I'm going to leave to my friend Matthew, who's going to come up and follow me. But I did want to just end on a couple notes, because I think this is important. So the caveats for this section, 
uh, we, we need to be careful about navigating the tension between access and success, okay? And simply counting paper credentials can create perverse incentives. This is just diploma mill. This is the diploma, diploma mill problem, right? We do not want to be printing paper in North Carolina. We don't want this to be like the currency in Weimar, Germany, right, where people were paying for things in wheelbarrows full of uh, 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 Deutschmarks, right? Um, focusing only on graduation rates can lead to gaming and not gains in attainment. And what I mean by that is if you, if you set up, a, let's say, a, a funding formula that rewards only uh, graduation rates, right, the quickest way for a campus to get there is to just cut off anybody who has any risk factor of dropping out, right? Uh, and what you wind up with is you wind up with a much higher graduation rate, but actually educational attainment doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't added to, isn't, isn't sort of, it doesn't grow, right? So these are the things I think are important to keep in mind. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Matthew. 